I, I will jump on the word disappointed. Yeah. I find that that's a very specific word that holds a lot of potential damage in yeah. parenting. Because I find that kids, when their parents feel disappointed, that's what crushes them. The level of pressure because they don't want to disappoint. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to see that. The, the energy of disappointment is too hard on children for some reason from the parents. Hi, Julia. <laughs> Maybe you would just introduce yourself uh, briefly and... Yeah. Thanks for having me, Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love our interviews together. So before we've uh, done other uh, podcasts and interviews, and they've been wonderful. And I, I have been working as a psychologist for over 20 years. I have a special interest in both fertility counseling, and that thankfully has uh, shifted into, thankfully, I mean, that many of my clients have had children. And mm -hmm. so that journey has continued into uh, becoming uh, parents and us working on parenting. And parenting has always been a passion of mine since I was a little kid. I've always wanted to help kids somehow. Even when I was a kid, I'm like, I want to help kids. <laughs> right? So the goal was to be a pediatrician. That didn't work out so well in terms of science for me. Uh, but ultimately, I realized now I've come full circle working with adults who are parents, uh, which in turn helps the children. So that's been my focus and my passion. And uh, yeah, I just love talking parenting and, and seeing how we can help people kindly make the shift um, into new ways because we can. Right. Thank you. So we've spent a lot of time talking about parenting stuff, self-compassion, emotion regulation, I guess, or um, taking responsibility, right, for our side of the parenting equation. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe just starting with your thoughts on the, the question that so often comes up is where's the balance, right, between taking responsibility for our part in the parenting situation and also ensuring that we're trying to teach our kids how to do that as well, right? So sure. not taking on too much of the burden ourselves, not blaming ourselves, but holding ourselves responsible, and then also yeah, allowing them to suffer in a sense so that they can learn those skills. Yeah, totally. And great question, because I think that that's where this style of parenting is misunderstood. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. I think that a lot of people think that we're just taking care of everything for them and never, ever causing any distress in them. Like, that's not, that's not the goal. The goal is for us to be able to handle their stressful situations, their distress, their dysregulation, their tantrum, you know, depending on the age, so that we can actually, like, be present during that and stay in a calmer state so that we can help them regulate to us. And then we can help them, like, guide them on ways to help themselves versus they're reacting. We're overwhelmed by their reaction. We decide that's ridiculous and unacceptable behavior. And then we start up. And then, of course, everybody just escalates. No one learns anything in the end. There's just so much resentment both ways. <laughs> so that's 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 kind of the, the typical way of ha things happening. And we're trying to change that so that when we own it, when we can stay responsible and accountable to our own emotional regulation, we can then help guide them to the place we want to go. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And you've also written a book, if I remember correctly, Take take the Car or or what's the It's title? Too Tired to Parent? Yes. Question mark, right? Yeah. <laughs> take but the you, Car. Well, don't you have an, an, like, um, an acronym or something? What's the yeah. acronym? So You'll find out that acronyms are everything to me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 now. yeah. But that particular acronym for a CAR, take the car, is to learn how to self care um, and then become aware and learn how to reflect because right. those are skills as parents that we need to, to do at all levels. Mm -hmm. And when we learn how to take the car, then we will be more equipped <laughs> to be able to handle our kids. Cool. Thank you for clarifying that. It's been a, a few years since we talked about that book. Um, yeah. It's a great book. And I will include that in the show notes. I, I, I don't know if it's in the other show notes, but anyway. Um, for sure. And I am working on a second edition. 
uh, really? of that book. Uh-huh. Yeah, where I'm going to have um, a bit of a twist because I've also started working a lot with South Asian folks. And um, because of that, I'm going to bring in like two tired to parent, but specifically with cultural elements that are relevant to how we were raised and how that needs to shift um, for healthier, more confident kids. Cool. And so back to kind of this idea of, of regulating ourselves, I always, only because I hear it often and these thoughts run through my mind, just really belaboring that point of, you know, we're, we're allowed to not regulate often. I, I always think I'm going to write this book, How to Be Mean to Your Kids. <laughs> That's going to sell well. I hope so. I hope so. So, you know, with obviously it's like, we don't want to be mean to our kids, but I think we're we're oversensitive. Obviously, that's a generalization, and and yeah, I guess like, can you help? You described a little bit before, but maybe more uh, with a scenario or something like that, where you know sometimes it's okay to be mean, or not so much that it's okay, but it doesn't mean you're a bad parent. Something like that, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that the, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's okay to suddenly yell, lose our, lose our cool. It's okay to, you know, yeah, like things are going to happen. Meaning it's, it's, it's going to happen. (laughs) It's we're, we're human as well. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, But if we are yelling or end up being mean or name calling or whatever that is, It is important to acknowledge that, stop, become aware, and then reflect and repair, right? Um, And repair isn't, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Like, I shouldn't have said it like that. Like, you don't have to be this, like, you don't have to fall to your knees. This is, it's more more a factual reply. Hey, you know what? I was really frustrated. I lost it. I said some things that I didn't want to say in the moment. Uh, You know, it was really hard for me. I'm sorry I said it that way. Can we talk about what happened? Because I feel like I'm going to keep losing it if you keep doing those things. So can we chat about how to help that? Because I know you're not doing it on purpose. And yet, you know, it's still happening again and again. And that's Mm -hmm. getting harder for me to tolerate. Nice. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. That's (laughs) I, I try to emulate that script, so to speak, when I act in ways that I'm not proud of. Um, but I, and, and I like your reminder, we are human, we're going to mess up and that's okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and what are maybe some of the, you've been talking about the, or even just today when we were talking about how we regulate ourselves and the fact that I think you're, you're not that much older than me, but uh, I don't know the, about that, but okay. yeah, well, okay. Maybe, but anyhow, the generationally speaking, you know, our parents were probably from the same, relatively the same elk, um, different cultures, obviously. And I I think this is a helpful frame for people to, up until, again, depending where where you're from and and your background and stuff, up until World War II, and shortly thereafter, there really wasn't any time for people to reflect on their emotions and their kind of to develop a lot of these skills. It was very much grinded out, grinded out, survive, survive, survive. And now that we aren't per se in that predicament, most people, at least in the Western world, um, now we are faced with those situations. And if we're to evolve and advance and have a more cohesive, I don't know, peaceful is not the right word, but cohesive society, we need to learn to deal with these things. So yeah, you mentioned the the vagus nerve stuff. Um, can you elaborate more on that and how how you're working mm-hmm. with those, those ideas? And if you agree yeah. with that that framing, I do 100. Uh, yeah. you, you're right. There was no space or time uh, or capacity to start to learn how to be conscious of our emotions mm-hmm. and and learn all of that. We were in survival mode, right? Like let's just all exist right you know that was that <laughs> yeah. was kind of the the goal um however like you said today at least here uh as you said we have the privilege really to be able to evolve as you said right not everybody has the privilege to evolve 
and we do and those were using your words you know evolution you know to evolve which was so good such a good word uh and so because of that the evolution of us is going to come through the emotional aspects we we here we've kind of got the safety survival piece down technically so the next level is going to be around the emotional piece right and we have this opportunity to do that but we're coming from a background where they've never done that. So this is new. This is very, very new, which is why self-compassion is critical when we're learning how to change our parenting, right? We're game changers. We're, we're, we're breaking a pattern that's been going on since the beginning of time, really. So give ourselves a break here that it's, it's going to be, we're going to fumble, right? Uh, but to help ourselves, Bumble a little less, I guess, um, yeah. is to strengthen our vagus nerve. And since I've discovered the vagus nerve, I've just been so excited because it really feels like a solid, like a concrete way for us to support our system, our nervous system that's in survival mode so that we can actually stay calm, stable, mm. clear, and then put into place the new changes that we want to do for parenting. Yeah. Any questions yeah. there? Before? Yeah. Can can you, I, I have a bit of a, I don't know if it's an ignorance, so to speak, to simplify things for myself. I tell myself the story that so many of these ideas are also similar when we have new ways of talking about them. I, I've learned a little bit about the vagus nerve uh, discovery, if you will. I can't remember the, the, people that kind of discovered it and brought it to everyone's attention scientifically. Um, yeah. What does that actually mean? And, and how do we work with that concept and idea? Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm far from a vagus nerve expert. Sure, sure, uh, I sure. do I'm just like learning, but <laughs> yeah. the basics of it, you know, it are, is that the vagus nerve, it runs from the base of our skull down to the bottom of our spine and it kind of like intertwines um, around the spine. And then it also sort of has, I feel like the way it's been described, it has almost like hands that come out and, and touch every organ. So imagine these hands coming out and holding your heart, hands coming and holding your liver, holding. So when it's weak, you can imagine we don't feel supported. And if our body, like our heart doesn't feel supported, let's say, this is a metaphor, both physically and emotionally, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, then it can send us into anxiety, panic. It can feel like, hey, I'm not, I'm not okay. And it, then it goes us right back to that safety thing. Oh no, better go into survival mode. And then we're no longer accessing our executive functioning, our higher level thinking, the emotional side, the empathy. It goes out the window and we just stay in our lizard survival brain again. So when we strengthen that nerve, we're actually telling our whole body mm -hmm. we're safe. So go do what you need to do. Like go advance. Go evolve. Right. And and what are some of the practices you're you're working with or discovering as you learn more about that that whole idea? Totally. Uh, well, this is what I love about it is that they're actually really doable, right? Mm. You know. Uh, so there's one um, breath work piece, particularly that it's a four second inhale, six second exhale, but it's both ways through the nose for this particular one, right? So that's that's a little counterintuitive to people, right? You know, we're used to going, right? yeah, you know, which is right. fine. And there is a side breath, which we can talk about as well. But mm -hmm. this one is sort of a proactive breathing um, exercise that activates our sympathetic nervous system as we breathe in, which is sort of the stimulus response, it like gets us moving, gets us going. And then it, it activates the parasympathetic nervous system on the breath out through the nose. And that's our peace response, right? So when we are feeling a bit heightened or extra stressed, if we do this by shortening the inhale, which is a stress or stimulus response, and increasing the parasympathetic response, we're telling the body and the brain, okay, we're, we're good, we're, we're calm, everything is okay, right? So we go into that rest state, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is where we can then access our executive functioning, organization planning, insight, empathy, all that much right. more easily. So that's one, four in, six out through the nose. 
Can we can I, I, love, I can we do that? Yeah. Let's do that right now for of course. yeah. Should we do a couple Beautiful. of cycles? Do you want to uh say in whole or in and out or how how should we count this out? Yeah, I'll I'll count it out for you. Okay. So let's okay. just you know take a minute. Imagine you're just sitting in a chair. Well, you are sitting in a chair, <laughs> close yes, your eyes. Yes, yes. And I want you just to drop your shoulders and just notice uh, your breath for a moment. And then when you're ready, I want you to take an inhale through your nose for four seconds, which I will count out. And we'll do this for two rounds. Okay. So we're going to inhale one, two, three, four, and exhale for six through your nose. One, two, three, four, five, six. And again, one, two, three, four, and exhaling for six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hmm. Thanks. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, and that was, another one yeah. I want to just yeah. share that's really important. And this is a little more around the heart rate variability, which you can research about, but it's uh, a coherent breathing. And this is something that I I do now every day. I do it for 10 to 15 minutes a day. Research says that after eight minutes, you're starting to uh, secrete all that good chemistry in your system. Uh, so by keeping it to 10, 15, it's like you're keeping hold on the go button, right, for the good chemistry. Um, but the goal for that is just it's an equal breath in and out through the nose. So it could be four in, four out, or six in, six out. I personally like six in, six out because I've been breathing for a while, so it works for me. But the goal there is to keep us balanced, right? Because we want to take action. We want to be able to be like up and ready with the sympathetic nervous system going. But we also want to kind of be chill and relaxed about it, right? You know, so that we're balanced. So that's what that does. Hmm. And after eight minutes, they're, they're saying, the research is saying that we start to secrete the dopamine, the oxytocin, the serotonin. And what that what happens is that gets generated apparently in the gut, and then the vagus brings it up to the brain. Wow! Right. So I yeah. probably messed that up a little bit in sure, terms sure, of sure. how it's yeah, done, yeah, but yeah, yeah, like yeah. that's the basic concept, right. and that's huge. Right. Really, really huge. Yeah. What's the? I think all of my. I'm sure in what some of my meditation training, I did only nose breathing, but. Really, I am a in through the nose, out through the mouth kind of person. What's the? Do you know much more about why it's kept to the nose or what's going on? I there? don't really fully understand yeah. that. Uh, yeah. I have to be honest. Yeah, and yeah. I need to look it up because this question comes up a lot. Does it? Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, people feel, feel uncomfortable actually breathing out through the nose. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I feel like it's it slows people down, and that's part mm. of it. Uh, because the alternative, if you're stuffy, because, you know, yeah. allergies or cold, yeah. what do you do those days? They say to do a straw breath. So as if yeah. you're inhaling right. and exhaling through. Right. Oh, Again, so the inhale, small, the inhales through the straw as well? If you can't. Yeah. Yeah. If you're stuffy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah then right. you could do both right. through the okay. straw. Right. Yeah. I do know I the mean, exhale. literal straw, but yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although that might actually help some people. Who knows? It might. Yeah, it's true. Uh, right, and that I know I've I've done exhale <sighs> straw sort of thing idea, but um, never both actually, and never I've never really done only na nasal. I'm gonna practice with that. Yeah, it's really cool. It, it is. I find it much more nourishing. Um, but like you know. Andrew Huberman talks about the side breath a lot and his, you know, he, he teaches that, you know, go in extra sip and then, <sighs> right. Yeah. And I feel like that's during a stressor. That would be great yeah. to use yeah. during a stressor. It's quick. It's kind of activates, right. Yeah. Um, which I like. And then uh, Dr. Navaz Habib, uh, he has a book, Upgrade Your Vegas Nerve. And, he is a friend and colleague as well, and he um, he talks a lot about like gargling every mm -hmm. morning as a way to activate it. He talks about humming. I mean, he isn't he mm -hmm. knows the research, right? So right, right. Uh, humming as well is is a great way to activate your vagus nerve. Movement, dance. So it, there's a lot of ways to get that thing going, you know, um, and strengthening. And strengthening, uh, Mike, is called being in the ventral vagal state. Huh. Um, 
And the when it's sort of weak, you're in the dorsal, you're in a dorsal state. Yeah. Cool. That's cool. Um, okay. And so I like also your distinction of the in the moments of acute stress or reactivity, having something that is likely to come online in those moments and that the physiological sigh is one of those things that I, I had this conversation with a client yesterday. They said, I have been practicing the four, seven, eight or the box breath. I can't remember. And then they said, although in those moments when you're really dysregulated, that's not going to happen. Yeah. And and then we practice the the sighing. And so maybe that'll come online in those moments. I exactly. Think, yeah. I saw Huberman talk when he was in Toronto and he mentioned that was, I can't remember when he said it was discovered, but around a hundred years ago, the, I can't remember the branch of neuroscience, but anyway. Yeah. And I think that still stands as the best way to calm ourselves down in, in a moment. Totally. And bring it back to parenting as you're saying right, that. I'm just right, going to say yeah. it out loud. Uh, yeah. Is that when we do a side <laughs> breath, it can be, have a lot of tone, mm. which the child can pick up as, oh, mommy or daddy doesn't like me. Right. right? You know, because it can be, oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And there's like, <laughs> which, again, I get it. Like, I get it. Right. But that that is just going to make it worse right, um, in right. some ways for the child. And then we're going to have a continued <laughs> escalation. So so I'm not saying you have to like be so paranoid that you're like, oh, my God, how did I sigh? But if you notice that you might have done it or they notice, then just acknowledge it. It's like I was just sighing. I honestly I see I, I heard I heard it. You're right. I did sound like I had a tone. I'm just trying to sigh because I'm frustrated. Right. Like. <laughs> Yeah. Owning it and laughing. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. Point. So good. My dog sighs all the time. I, I think, <laughs> I think, I think it was Huberman where I heard that from. Sighing, maybe not only him, does help us relax. I think it releases oxytocin. I think in the self compassion right. practices, they talk about that too. Yeah. <sighs> it's so funny. Do you think the? I love how you pointed out that the sighing even has a tone to it, and. Often, probably subconsciously, we sigh with a tone or it, it, it expresses our emotion almost that we're feeling, which is really interesting. Um, yeah. Okay. And ah, any other, that was a much more pleasant sigh, sounding That's sigh, right. wasn't it? Yeah. Was a- <laughs> <laughs> ah. Where else, or in that, you articulate the communication so nicely of just owning it and just saying it and again it doesn't mean we're taking the blame or uh, not trying to teach our kids responsibility for their side of it how do you see young people maybe your own kids or others learning those skills or or bringing them online or i don't know if that's really the right question to ask but like what's the next step right of us practicing these things and sharing them and I, i think that it's really about I mean, I do a whole acronym piece around being a fair parent. And to me, I mean, the acronym represents obviously certain certain things, mm-hmm. uh, but really the concept of being fair is I think what we want to be striving for because children love it when we're being fair. They, they just want to feel like you get it and, okay, that makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, I know there have been times when, you know, uh, Talina, let's say, has responded to me in a with a tone or with a, a certain level of rudeness that I felt. And I because I've been fair, I'm like, hey, you know, I know you're having a hard day and that one just didn't feel good to me. Right. That that wasn't that wasn't called for. I didn't deserve that. And then she's able to pause and go, yeah, okay, you're right. I'm sorry. Right. Mm-hmm. Um so I'm not getting her in trouble for it. I'm just like, hey, you know what, like let's be a little more aware. Like, I understand you're having a tough time. So I empathize with that. And it's also true that that wasn't cool. Right. Right. Now, if I haven't been practicing being fair, and I've always been sort of like, what's wrong with you? Why do you do that? You're always rude. You're, you know, that kind of, she would not have responded to me that way. Right. Right. She would have just blamed me for something. As you're saying that, I'm reflecting on my own experience where my, I I try to practice what you're saying, being fair or kind of consistent and thoughtful and then at the same time i often sometimes it's a bit of an uh, an excuse not an excuse but i don't want to deal with this kind of attitude 
where the world's not fair. So out in their lives, right, the way they're treated, the way things roll out, school's not fair in lots of ways, your teacher's not fair, your friends aren't fair, like the world is not fair in a sense. Can you just distinguish the, those two things or how you see them? Yeah. So a lot of people will be like, okay, as parents, we have to also represent the world so that yeah, they yeah, right. learn how to navigate it, right? Which yeah. I actually have the exact opposite belief. I say that the world is going to do that to them. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's not going to be fair in many situations. So I need them to have somewhere that's safe. Mm. So I want to make sure that I'm that space for them because otherwise the world is just going to crush them and they're going to have nowhere to go. Right. And as humans, we need a tribe. We need that. Right. And so when the external world tribe is wishy washy or has their moments, you know, uh, then if they know that I'm there and I get them and I'm fair, then that's more important because then I can help them and guide them and send them back out there to navigate all the things. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because they will. You're right. Like the world has lots of things that aren't fair. Mm -hmm. There's things that are too. But yeah, yeah. the other benefit to being fair at home is that you're teaching them to have a lens where someone can be fair. So when they get out in the world, they're not looking for all the negative um, pieces, right? They're not looking for who else is unfair to me, who else is mean, who else is right They're They're actually going out going, oh, you know what? Maybe there's some fairness out there. And they might notice, so they'll let that filter in, right? And then when they don't hit, get those people, they come back home and say, wow, this happened. This was awful, right? And I'll say, yeah, that was awful. Let's figure out how to handle it. Yeah, Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I, I think I needed to hear that because I tend to be one of those people who is like, certainly have moments where I do say things like, I am a representation of the world. Therefore, I can justify my behavior or something like that. Like, as you said, right? parents think we need to represent the world. Although that doesn't mean that needs to be separate. And I like your point about sometimes the world is fair and we want to learn how to find situations where or be attuned to good environments or people who tend to skew towards the fairness or, or that kind of idea. Treat us well treat us with dignity exactly. and respect. And I think I, yeah, I think I do. I'm going to have to monitor that a bit more. Like I, I think I'm pretty good about that. And then there's times where, yeah, to our earlier discussion of we're human, all that stuff where I just, <laughs> I just kind of, oh, I don't care. Suck it up. Deal with it. The world's not fair. Life's not fair. Get over it kind of idea. And that usually mm -hmm. comes out of tiredness or impatience. And then at the exactly. same time, I do think there's a healthy dose of that. Uh, where we just need to let it go, right? Or just accept that sometimes things don't work out. Totally. And I think yeah. the healthy dose yeah. is is the part that's us being human. It's going to naturally occur for me, yeah. for, for anybody, yeah. you know, that's yeah. going to happen. So I don't want to deliberately do that as a lesson. Uh, right. Because the world <laughs> will be doing that, right? Right. So, yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that, I love that uh, reminder of, they need a place where you know maybe they don't always expect us to be feral they know if they tell us something we're going to be disappointed or something like that although we don't want to scare them away from that or that's not the right word maybe right we want to create the environment in which they're more likely to share with us what's going on right or to feel protected exactly. by us and that kind of thing Exactly. I, I will jump on the word disappointed. Yeah. I find that that's a very specific word that ha holds a lot of um, potential damage in yeah. parenting. Yeah. Uh, because I find that kids, when their parents feel disappointed, that's what crushes them. Right. You know, as, as a South Asian, as you may know, grades are very important. And uh, so that's always been emphasized in our households. And for good reason is to be, you know, to, to create a good life and all the things. But the level of pressure, because they don't want to disappoint, they don't want to hear that, they don't want to see that. Right. It's not because they're going to be hit or I mean, some are, but it's not because of that. It's, it's that face of disappointment, that energy that kids can't handle. And my kids are like going into bathrooms and, and when they get their grades and passing out in fear, 
right? Like it's it's uh, talking to a young uh, South Asian girl, and she was telling me about the other kids. It's like so many get their ninety eight percent are in the bathroom passing out in fear of disappointing their parents. That's not okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. That is yeah. not okay. So disappointment people feel will teach them a lesson. It's too much from the parent. Uh, so instead it's like, Hey, that wasn't cool. I'm not loving it. Right. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not thrilled with how that worked out or let's look at how we can change that or shift that or what we need to do. So it's not dropping in. It's okay. It's okay. We're not doing that. Yeah. 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 But the, the, the energy of disappointment is too hard on children for some reason. Right. And from the parents yeah, in particular. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It is a heavy emotion for sure. Or, you know, when you'll, you'll hear people say something like, I'm not angry, I'm disappointed, or I'm... To me, I think people would rather yeah. be, angry, be angry than disappointed. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. To be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Which, which, do you see any connection to the idea of pro-social shame with that? I mean, maybe it's not the right, but I do well, it think... Is shame. Yeah, yeah. It is. Yeah, it is. Disappointment yeah. is, I feel shame. It triggers shame yeah. within me when a parent yeah. is disappointed. Right. Um, where anger triggers fear, maybe. Right. But when we're looking at sort of the levels and what it does to us, fear is still a moving energy. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Shame is like mud. Right. Yeah. So the yeah. problem with that shame is that it shuts us down. Yeah. And then we can't learn or make the change because we're just like mud. It's <laughs> <Right? laughs> a nice uh, analogy. Yeah. And and I think that the where pro social shaming came from was in the tribe when someone was being difficult or or creating potential uh, harm in the in the tribe and and risking the tribe. We needed them to shut down. We needed them to turn into mud so that wasn't risking, you know, the safety of of the tribe. We're not risking safety of our tribe here. We're not, you know, uh, for the reasons that we just feel disappointed. There's just nothing to do with survival. Um, like imminent survival. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it comes from a good place where it made sense to shame because it had the same effect, yeah. shut them down. Yeah. Right. But today, there's really little to no room for needing that. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. I never sort of thought about it that way. I need some time to consent to ponder that. I don't know what to think about that. I was going to say, so our so our our quote unquote social norms, right, are a form of pro social shame. They sort of keep us in check, similar to what you're describing. I guess that's different though than something happens where someone makes a mistake or behaves in a way that's not ideal, then they get shamed. Right. Rather than through disappointment. Yeah. What are we going to do about that? Right. Right. One one in in Anna Lemke's book on Addiction, dopamine nation, it's called. Uh, 12, the 12 step rooms, Anna Lemke describes those as pro social shame or, or sort of an environment where pro social shame can exist and be healed, something like that. Because people share their shame in a way and then the group holds it, right? And then we, it, it holds it in compassion, really. It's really a beautiful. I was also talking to this guy last night about that in, in a good, quote unquote, good, healthy, it's all in context, 12 step group, it is such a beautiful place where we can share our shame and have it be held by the group or the tribe. And then it becomes, yeah, we guess we, we get out of the mud. I love that analogy of the mud. Mm, yeah, yeah, with compassion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And I think that's beautiful. And, 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 you know, the whole idea of the collective coming together and sharing mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and normalizing that so that we can heal together, right, is so beautiful. I suppose in parenting, right, mm -hmm, because they're mm -hmm. alone, the child's alone, they're not in a collective, you know, shame space right, where we right, all get right, it. Right, we all, right. it. It becomes impossible, right, to step out of that ourselves. Because like you said, it's a shared experience. That's how we get out of it. Uh, so these children are navigating this by themselves. If they happen to have a sibling who's experiencing the exact same thing and they are on board together, that can help. Mm -hmm. But why are we doing that to them? Like, we don't want to do that. Yeah. There are other ways to get them to learn and be guided than, right. than shaming. 
right right and and maybe circling back i know we're kind of running out of time here the mm. to your original point of the parents us as parents caring for ourselves so that we don't pass these things on so much i'm careful to say those are things i have learn to work through, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously they still come up sometimes where my own shame and inadequacy gets transferred onto my kids. Sure. Um, yeah. So maybe how do we, maybe you can just sort of tie it up with, with what you were talking about earlier in terms of shame and how we can be more aware of our own shame so that we're not dumping it on our kids or projecting it. Totally. Yeah. So guilt and shame are both in that lower kind of muddy, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> muddy realm. Guilt's a little less muddy. I mean, they, yeah, there's, a, yeah. there's sort of that. Yeah. Um, and if we are feeling activated in that, typically it's guilt, right? You know, uh, as parents, then it becomes about us again. It's no longer about the child. Uh, so we want to really learn how to give ourselves compassion. You know, like that's a key piece here. So the physiological piece is strengthening that vagus nerve, right? Let's not battle physiology because, to be honest, Mike, it's going to win because it, <laughs> Indeed. it thinks we're dying. It thinks we're in yep. threat, yep. right? Like like imminent threat. As long as our body thinks we're an imminent threat, our mind is not useful, right? <laughs> so, um, so we want to first strengthen. So I, I have a saying now, I say all roads lead to Vegas. Right? So, <laughs> nice. so start there, right? you know, <laughs> with those. And then as you're learning how to shift, you know, out of uh, the ways, the old ways, old school ways of sort of parenting, then with compassion, when you slip, right, is the key to making the change. So slowing down and saying, okay, that wasn't the greatest. That didn't feel good. And I am exhausted. I have had a hard time. I'm mm -hmm. not excusing myself. I'm just mm -hmm. saying, hey, mm -hmm. I get it. I get why this happened. So let's go and talk to them, repair it, you know, and see what we can do to help guide this better. Mm. Right. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> I was trying to do the, the, na the navel breathing as you were talking there. Right. It's so hard to remind myself to breathe out of the nose. But I'm yeah, going to try that. I'm going to try that. Um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom on all these questions. Any lasting thoughts or or comments? You know, all your information will be in the show notes if people want to see that. But yeah, any lasting okay. things we didn't say or you want to add? I think there's always so many things when yeah, 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 once yeah, you get yeah. the ball rolling. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, so for today, no, I think let, let's continue on okay, at a different well, day, you well. know, topics yeah. like self-sacrifice and things mm. like that and, and how to, you know, what, how it no longer serves us and, and things. Mm. So yeah. it's, there's lots of fun things, but for today, no, I think that was wonderful. Right. Uh, you know, I would love for people to check out the fair parent. Um, I did a fair parent Instagram live for 10 day challenge mm. that I've left on my Instagram. I've also added it to YouTube. So if people want to try that, we start with a Vegas exercise um, each day, a different one. So you can sample the ones that you like and uh, and then go through the acronym to, to learn how to actually be a fair parent. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me, Mike. It's uh, awesome. Yeah, it is awesome. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content. And otherwise, have a great day. Peace out. <laughs>